Welcome back to Tissue Biomechanics. Today we will discuss the structure of collagen, the biomechanics of collagenous tissues, and the testing of soft collagenous connective tissues. Collagen is the primary structural protein in the body. It is the most prevalent protein comprising 30% of all proteins, and it is highly conserved between species, meaning that it has not undergone many significant evolutionary changes. The molecules are arranged in a staggered pattern that gives rise under X-ray diffraction or electron microscopy to a banded appearance seen here at high resolution. It's relatively resistant to enzymatic breakdown, but its half-life varies widely between tissues from days in tissues such as periodontal ligament to years in mature bone. Injury accelerates the turnover of collagen. Collagen has a hierarchical molecular structure. It's a triple helix of alpha chains characterized by glycine XY repeats, where X tends to be proline and Y tends to be hydroxyproline. And for this reason, hydroxyproline is often used as an assay for measuring the amount of collagen in a tissue. The triple helix, together with the crosslinks between the tropocollagen molecules give rise to a material that is very stiff and stable. The crosslinks are covalent bonds at the ends of the molecules that connect the tropocollagen molecules in a staggered pattern that gives rise to the banding seen in the fibril scale. The striation spacing of the bands is 670 angstroms, so too small to see under the light microscope. The alpha chains of collagen are coded by different genes and most collagens consist of two or three different alpha chains. This gives rise to more than 20 different collagen types. The fibrilla collagens are the most common. They are types 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. Types 9, 12, and 14 are fibril-associated collagens. Types 4, 10, and 8 are the network-forming collagens. Type 6 is the filamentous collagen, and Type 7 is an anchoring filament collagen. Types 1 and 3 are found particularly in connective tissues, tendons, ligaments, also bone for type 1, uh, and skin, uh, as well as in blood vessels. Type 2 is predominant in cartilage. Type 5 is predominant in fetal membranes. Cartilage also has types 6 and 9, and the basement membrane is formed from the network forming collagen type 4. Fibrilla collagens, mostly type 1 and to a certain extent type 3, are the strongest and stiffest. Elastin forms the amorphous matrix in tissues. The tropoelastic polypeptide chains have 786 amino acid residues. They are rich in glycine, alanine, and proline. It's rapidly synthesized within an hour by fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. And the tropoelastin molecules are highly cross-linked, as you can see here, by covalent bonds at desmosine and isodesmosine residues into 10 nanometer microfibrils that when unloaded exist in highly coiled chains that straighten out under strain. These microfibrils in turn aggregate into 200 to 5,000 nanometer fibrils like the ones seen here that branch and form 2D sheets or 3D networks in a tissue here like skin. They can be stretched up to 150% and store elastic energy almost completely reversibly. Elastin turnover is very slow. Much of it is formed during development and may last for decades. Let's compare the material properties of collagen and elastin with those of some other materials. The stiffness of collagen is about 1 gigapascal and its ultimate tensile stress is about 100 megapascals. This compares with a stiffness of steel of 200 gigapascals, 10 gigapascals for wood, but only 1 megapascal for rubber. Bone, as we've seen before, is about 18 gigapascals, and the strength properties of bone are actually quite similar to the strength to the ultimate tensile stress of collagen, which is similar to that of wood, but an order of magnitude lower than that of steel. Elastin, on the other hand, is very soft. It's less than one megapascal in stiffness, but because it constrains so much, 
its strength is actually quite high. In comparison, the stiffness of silk is actually 10 gigapascals. However, it's not enough just to know the material properties of individual tissue constituents, such as collagen and elastin, to know the material properties of tissues, which are composites with complex microstructure and a complex macroarchitecture that dominates the material response. Let's take a look at an example by looking at ligaments and tendons. Ligaments connect bones together with bones, whereas tendons connect bones to muscle. They transmit forces and aid in stabilizing joint motion. They absorb impact and stresses and prevent large dislocations and displacement. They're primarily uniaxial, one-dimensional loading elements, as these diagrams imply. They have highly hierarchical structure. So here we see the structure of tendon. We saw the tropocollagen molecule forming into the microfibrils and fibrils in the earlier slides. Those fibrils, in turn, are organized into bundles known as fascicles that also have the cells that maintain the fibrils, the fibroblasts, embedded. Inside the fascicle, the fibers usually have a wavy or crimped organization, and then several fascicles bundled together to form the tendon, which is wrapped in a sheath or membrane of collagen. So you can see that the hierarchical organization of the tendon spans many orders of spatial scale. Now, ligaments are like tendons, ligaments are loaded along an axis parallel to their fibers. Their organization is also fascicular, meaning bundled, and the fibers of the unloaded ligament are crimped. Loading tends to straighten the fibers out. The composition of ligaments is 75 to 80% collagen and 5% or less elastin. The rest of the tissue consists of proteoglycans, other proteins, vasculature, and cells. These diagrams show the organization of the ligaments in the knee joint. There are the two collateral ligaments on the side of the knee, the lateral collateral ligament on the outside, and the medial collateral ligament on the inside, and the two cruciate ligaments that cross over uh, on the inside of the knee joint, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. Here we see that the unloaded medial collateral ligament and anterior cruciate ligament are crimped or wavy, and when they become loaded, these crimps are straightened out. One popular way to measure the mechanical properties of ligaments is to leave them intact on the bone and measure the entire so-called bone-ligament-bone complex. The major advantage of this is that the bones can be used as a natural clamp to avoid having to dissect and damage the ligament. However, this method, as you can imagine, is more practical for measuring the collateral ligaments like the MCL than the cruciate ligaments, which are more hidden from view from the optical imaging system, in this case, that's used to measure the strain by tracking the motion of labels marked on the ligament. From those material motions, the regional strains in the tissue can be measured as the ligament is loaded. This is the kind of measurement that's made in a preparation like this. You can see that the load or force here is shown in newtons, and the elongation is shown in millimeters, and once the tissue gets stretched beyond about six millimeters, it starts to show signs of yielding, and then it fails abruptly at about eight millimeters elongation. This load elongation curve is said to be representative of the structural properties of the femur MCL tibia complex. If we use the cross-sectional area and the original length to compute the stress and the strain, then the stress-strain curve is said to be representative of the mechanical properties of the ligament material. And the slope of this curve, the tangent modulus, you can see becomes relatively constant after the strain increases beyond 1 to 
The structural explanation for this curve is that the curved region below 2% is known as the toe region of the curve, and this is the region when the crimping in the collagen is straightening out. Once the crimp in the fibers has straightened out, then the tangent modulus is higher and the stress strain curve is fairly linear. And in this linear range, the tangent modulus is therefore constant. And when you see a report of the tangent modulus of collagen, it's frequently based on the linear portion of mechanical tests in collagenous connective tissues such as ligament and tendon. Beyond about 6%, the stress strain relation again becomes nonlinear, uh, but now uh, curving in a concave way towards the x axis. And this is a reflection of yielding and micro failures that are occurring in the tissue up until the point about 8 or 9% when catastrophic failure occurs at an ultimate tensile stress of about 75 megapascals. You'll notice that this number is somewhat lower than what I quoted for collagen alone, and that's based on the observation that the ligament is not all collagen. Sometimes workers try to account for this by assuming that all the load is being borne by the collagen, working out what the cross-sectional area fraction of the collagen is, and then computing the stress based only on the collagen cross-sectional fraction. As you can imagine, clamping the tissue to the test device is a considerable challenge. The device that holds and clamps the tissue must be stiffer and stronger than the test material so that its strain doesn't contribute to the measured strain and it doesn't fail. Ligaments have their own built-in clamps in the form of bones, and it's common to drill holes in the bone to insert a clamp or steel rod. But if the clamp is too far from the ligament, then the measured strain may include bone deformation effects. And if the clamp is too close to the tissue, then there's the risk of damage at the insertion or failure of the clamp. Tendons only have one natural clamp. They're only attached at one end to the bone. And so they're a little more difficult to test. And wherever you clamp a tissue, you have to worry not only about the effects of the clamp, but also about inhomogeneities and end effects on the tissue. One useful way to relate the mechanics of individual ligaments to the function of an intact joint is to test the entire joint. For example, this shows the design of a six degree of freedom knee testing rig. You can see that in addition to three displacement degrees of freedom, one along the axis of the joint and two transverse to the axis of the joint. This apparatus also has three rotational degrees of freedom. So there's a knee flexion angle, there's a twist angle of the tibia about the femur, and then there's this angle in the transverse plane called the varus valgus angle. So a device like this can be used to test the knee joint with all the ligaments intact, and then to gradually remove the ligaments by cutting them one at a time and retest to get a measure of the contribution of the individual ligaments to the mechanics of the whole knee. Now measuring strain in soft tissues is more challenging than measuring strain in hard engineering materials that only undergo infinitesimal deformations. One simple soft strain gauge that can be subjected to relatively high strains is called the mercury and rubber strain gauge. The mercury and rubber strain gauge consists of a thin elastic tube filled with mercury and connected to a circuit across which a voltage is imposed. As the strain gauge which is attached to the tissue stretches, the length of the column of mercury increases and the cross-sectional diameter decreases with the result that the resistance increases and the current decreases. So by measuring the current through this mercury and rubber strain gauge, uh, you can calibrate it for strains. However, this is a fairly cumbersome device. It still needs to be physically attached to the tissue at both ends, and its stiffness may not be negligible compared to some uh, very soft and small tissue samples. An alternative technique that doesn't require physical contact across the interval being measured is the use of piezoelectric crystals. This technique is known as sonomicrometry. One piezoelectric crystal is implanted in the tissue and stimulated by 
a high frequency electrical source. This causes the piezoelectric crystal to vibrate and send off ultrasonic waves and that crystal is called the transmitter. When the vibration travels through the tissue and reaches the other piezoelectric crystal, it induces a current that can be measured, and this crystal is known as the receiver. Because it takes a finite time for this ultrasonic signal to travel through the tissue, knowing the speed of sound in the tissue, it's possible to calibrate the phase delay between the oscillating signal measured at the receiver and the input oscillation at the transmitter to measure the distance that must have been traveled by the ultrasonic waves and thereby get a real-time measure of the length of the segment of tissue between the crystals. There are also semiconductor, uh, usually resistive or piezo-resistive devices, but these usually only work for uh, very small strains uh, and therefore are only appropriate for uh, hard materials such as bone. Recall that we defined several different strain tensors, so it's worth considering for your experiment which strain tensor is both most convenient and most appropriate. Let's just recall them in one dimension. The Cauchy infinitesimal strain in one dimension, epsilon 1, 1, would be lambda minus 1, where lambda is the stretch ratio L over L naught. In other words, epsilon 1, 1 would be delta L over L naught. The Lagrangian finite strain, E11, is one half of lambda squared minus one, which is one half of L squared minus L naught squared over L naught squared. Recall that the finite strains measure squared length change. And the Eulerian Almansi's strain tensor, A to 1, 1, or little e11, is one half of one minus one over lambda squared, which is one half of L squared minus L naught squared over L squared. Now, in the limit where L and L0 are very close to each other, all these three strains give you approximately the same number. However, recall that the Lagrangian and Eulerian strains, while they are quadratic, have the advantage that they're exact for large deformation. On the other hand, the Cauchy strain is linear and is appropriate for infinitesimal strains. However, it's also worth recognizing that in one dimension, they can all be computed simply by knowing the stretch ratio L over L naught. The more important differences between the finite and infinitesimal strains and the different finite strains become more significant when we make our measuring strains in two or three dimensions. It's also worth thinking for a moment what length L naught is. For the purposes of characterizing material properties, L naught should be the unloaded stress-free length, but that might not be the most practical reference length because it may be harder to reproduce because tissues which are nonlinear tend to be most soft at zero stress or low. So occasionally a strain may be referred to a reference length L0 that is not unloaded and then subsequently corrected before using it in the stress-strain relation. If we're going to measure the stress-strain relationship, we're going to need to know the stress-free state of the tissue. How can we identify the best stress-free reference state for our stress and strain calculations? Soft tissues buckle under compression, and the compliant toe region down here of the curve makes it difficult to identify the exact transition from tension to compression because the slope of this curve is so small. Error in the strain is likely. One possible solution to this is to apply a small known tear load to the tissue and measure the reference length during the experiment at that more easily reproducible load. And then subsequently, after measuring the stress strain curve above and below the tear load, interpolate to estimate the true zero stress reference state or the stress strain curve. Although we commonly approximate soft tissues as elastic, they also have many anelastic properties. These include hysteresis, in which the curves for loading and unloading are different, and the area in the loop created by loading and unloading represents the energy dissipated during the load cycle. Preconditioning is another phenomenon that is anelastic. The apparent material properties depend on the load history, such that the second cycle of loading is different from the first, and the third is different from the second. 
However, with sufficient repetitions of the stress strain cycle, the curves become reproducible. In ligaments and tendons, this typically occurs between four and seven cycles of repetition. And after that, the tissue is said to be preconditioned. Soft tissues display a number of properties that can be described by the theory of viscoelasticity. For example, stress relaxation, where in response to a step change in the strain, as seen here, the stress rises instantaneously, but then decays, at first fast and then slower, to a new asymptotic level. This is known as stress relaxation and may take 20 minutes to an hour in soft tissues. Creep is the viscoelastic response to a step change in the stress. You can see that the strain gradually increases with time following a step's change in the stress. When the load is removed, the reversal of this response is called creep recovery. So you'll see in both cases there's an instantaneous response to the change in the load, and then there's a slow time-dependent response. So this time-dependent behavior is what characterizes viscoelasticity. Another time-dependent response is the effect of strain rate. Increased strain rate tends to result in increased stiffness due to the effects of viscous stresses in the material. This effect is typically small in soft tissues for the normal range of strain rates, but can be important in relation to prevention of injury when the strain rates can be unusually high. Age is one of a number of important factors that affects the properties of collagenous tissues. Here, for example, we see during development that the collagenous tissues of a rabbit, which are similar to those of other species, progressively increase in stiffness from 3 to 5 to 12 months of age, but then by 36 months of age have started to decline after skeletal maturity was reached. Here we see the strength of collagenous tissues in humans as a function of age, and you can see that there's a significant decline after skeletal maturity. As humans age, the maximum force their anterior cruciate ligament can sustain is significantly impaired. This, however, has as much to do with the changes in geometry of the tissue as it does to the changes in material properties. So this is a structural property, not only a material property. Another factor that affects the mechanical properties of connective tissues is immobilization due to uh, injury or bed rest, for example. Here we see that immobilization of the medial collateral ligament, much more so than of the anterior cruciate ligament, causes a decrease in the material stiffness. The MCL is more metabolically active, so it's turning over collagen more rapidly, and as it generates new collagen that isn't being loaded, the mechanical strength of that collagen is compromised, possibly due to a decrease in intermolecular cross-linking. However, the ACL doesn't turn over its collagenous tissue so quickly, it just tends to atrophy or reduce in size uh, as it becomes immobilized, and that effect is not characterized by the stress-strain relation, which is merely a measurement of the material properties. Heart valves are an excellent example of a collagenous connective tissue with a 2D structure and function. The mature heart valves have three layers, the fibrosa, the spongiosa, and the ventricularis in the case of the aortic or pulmonic valves, or atrialis in the case of the tricuspid and mitral valves between the atria and ventricles. Collagen comprises two-thirds of the dry weight of the heart valves. The fibrosa is predominantly fibrillar collagens, 75% type 1 and about 25% type 3, that are circumferentially oriented and wavy when unloaded. They provide tensile stiffness and give rise to highly nonlinear stress-strain relations. The atrialis or ventricularis comprise primarily radially oriented filamentous elastic fibers that promote elastic recoil. And the spongiosa is primarily proteoglycans with collagen fibers and provides some compressibility. The annulus of the valve is the base. 
and that distributes the force in the valve to the surrounding tissue. The cusps of the leaflets are where the tissue overlaps during valve leaflet closure or coaptation. Skin is an excellent example of a three-dimensional collagenous tissue. Collagen is 65 to 70% of the tissue, uh, with a greater fraction of type 3 collagen than ligaments. There are also elastin fibers and fibroblasts. Elastin is 5 to 10% and proteoglycans are 1.5 to 2% of the tissue. The crimp in the collagen is very prominent in young skin, but tends to decrease in aging skin. The elastin crimp, on the other hand, tends to increase with age, thereby decreasing recoil while increasing the stiffness of the skin. So this increase in stiffness associated with a decrease in collagen crimp and an increase in elastic crimp resulting in a decrease in recoil provide a nice mechanical explanation for the formation of wrinkles in aging skin. Compared with tendons, you can see that skin being more crimped and randomly oriented is more compliant than tendons. It needs to be for its functions and the orientation of the collagen fibers tend to change with the load and tend to line up with the direction of maximum strain. Collagen is much stiffer than elastin, but it also has greater hysteresis, meaning that it dissipates more energy during loading and unloading than elastin does. So let's summarize the key points that we've learned about collagenous connective tissues. Collagen is a ubiquitous structural protein of many types, all having a triple helical structure that is cross-linked in a staggered array to form microfibrils. Elastin is highly elastic and cross-linked into tangled microfibrils and much less stiff and more elastic than collagen. Collagen is organized into one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three dimensions in different tissue types, such as ligaments and tendons. The 1D hierarchical arrangement of stiff collagen fibers in ligaments and tendons gives these tissues high tensile stiffness and strength. The crimping, coiling, and waviness of the collagen matrix gives collagenous tissues a nonlinear tensile stress-strain relation. The wavy 2D and 3D arrangement of collagen fibers and a greater fraction of elastin in tissues such as heart valves and skin permits higher strains and more nonlinear stress-strain relations. The different tissue types require different testing configurations, including different types of tissue attachment and clamping, different loading conditions, and different methods for measuring stress and strain. They also give rise to different degrees of viscoelasticity and uh, anelastic responses.